Uh, welcome, folks. Uh, my name is Dr. Ross Scalise. I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Hector Rivera. He's off camera right now, but uh, he'll be ably assisting me with some of the technical aspects of this webinar. Um, and in fact, he'll be giving this same webinar tomorrow in Spanish. Both of us are general internists. Uh, we are full-time faculty here at the University of Miami, and we work at the Gordon Center for Research and Medical Education, which as many of you probably know already, is the home of Harvey. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I had a little look at the pre-registration list and uh, saw that folks from all over the world were planning to join us. Kudos to those of you in the Far East, if you're really there, uh, at uh, midnight or one o'clock in the morning, uh, I really thank you for making that extra effort to be with us. But we have folks from Europe, from South Africa, uh, from Central and South America as well. So welcome to all. It's my pleasure uh, to be here with you uh, to conduct this webinar about integrating Harvey and UMedic for clinical skills training. I would like to uh, first make uh, some acknowledgments to our hosts at uh, Lairdall Medical. Uh, who are hosting this webinar. A uh, special thanks to John Maxey for advanced organization and Marion Young, as well as Nick Smirnoff, who is uh, behind the scenes live with us, uh, handling some of the technical aspects of the webinar. Um, I'd also like to start, as we usually do with academic presentations, making a, a disclosure. Many of you know that Harvey is made at the University of Miami, and Lairdahl distributes University of Miami education systems in many parts of the world. Dr. Rivera and myself are both full-time faculty here at the university, and we receive no compensation whatsoever related to the distribution of Harvey or other university or Lairdahl educational systems. I'd like to start with a little bit of a, a virtual tour. Um, for those of you who have not had the opportunity to visit us here in, in Miami, uh, this is the entrance to the Gordon Center. And I always like to start uh, visits here uh, by taking people through the front door uh, into our two-story atrium entrance and looking up above uh, where we have our mission statement, which is saving lives through simulation technology. We're not, in fact, the Gordon Center for Simulation. Um, and I like to make the point that what we're really all about is trying to use educational technologies like simulation just as a means uh, to the end of providing better training uh, for medical students, nursing students, uh, residents, and practitioners in a range of uh, medical professions. The ultimate goal, of course, is that they will take better care of patients, and that's the saving lives part. And that's going to be a theme that's going to run through this webinar, um, where I want to emphasize that the technology uh, is there as a tool uh, to try to meet our educational goals. So with that in mind, uh, the goals of this webinar are to, first of all, we're, we are going to spend some time describing features of the next generation Harvey. We've made some recent updates uh, to the system, and we'll talk about those, as well as our UMedic cardiology e-learning programs. We're also, though, going to discuss how it's vitally important that any educational technology is integrated into the curriculum if you want to try to achieve uh, your learning outcomes. And at the end, once we've gone through that process, I hope you'll be able to develop a plan for using Harvey and UMedic in your own programs. Looking at the pre-registration list, I see that many of you are at institutions which are current Harvey and or UMedic users. Um, so I hope that will give you some practical tips for how to optimize uh, your training with these systems. So uh, before I do that, i just uh, like to get an idea of who is with us, um, if you could answer this question, tell me if you're a physician, a nurse, perhaps a physician's assistant, you know, maybe a, an educator in the basic sciences, um, an educationalist, or perhaps a technology or simulation specialist, more on the technical side of operations at your sim simulation center. So you should have some radio buttons there. If you could just make a choice and uh, let me know who I'm talking to. So about 20% doctors, about a quarter nurses, 40% are educationists, and another quarter are technology people. All right, great. So we have a nice spread across the spectrum. Um, we are well aware that many different types of programs are using Harvey and UMedic. Um, and for those of you who don't have these systems yet, um, hopefully 
uh, the general idea that we're talking about for integrating these technologies into a curriculum will apply. You can pick your favorite simulator or your favorite piece of educational technology and apply these same principles. So next question, now that I know who you are, is whom are you teaching? So what's your learner population? Are you teaching medical students or nursing students or PA students, perhaps students in other professions like physical therapy, et cetera? Are you in the postgraduate level rather than undergraduate level with residents or fellows? Maybe advanced practice nurses if you're in the nursing profession. Perhaps you're a provider of continuing education for people already in practice. So if you'd make a choice there, I realize that many of you teach multiple learner populations. Maybe choose the one that you work with most. All right, so the lion's share or the biggest chunk are uh, with medical students. So we have a lot of people in undergraduate medical education, about 40%. And then, so interesting, so we have some nurse educators, but you're working perhaps uh, more with medical students. Um, also advanced practice nursing and some people providing continuing education for those in practice. So that's great. The last question, um, since we're talking about Harvey um, and the particular skill set that he does is the context, which is clinical skills. I'm wondering, just yes or no, how many of you are involved with clinical skills teaching? By that I mean physical exam or patient assessment skills. In some countries you call this semiology. Uh, diagnostic or bedside uh, clinical reasoning. All right, so the vast majority of you, more than 90%, the vast majority of you are, are teaching clinical skills, and so this is great because the things that we're going to be talking about with Harvey will be perfectly appropriate for your educational planning. Again, if you're not involved with these, the hope the lessons learned for this curriculum integration process, you'll be able to apply for whatever uh, the learning outcomes are that you're trying to achieve. So. Um, again, we're here at the home of Harvey. This is Dr. Gordon doing what he always, always loved to do, which was uh, teaching at the bedside with a group of learners. And many of you probably know that Harvey is the longest continuous mannequin, a computer enhanced mannequin in all of uh, health professions education. Research has shown that the skills that people acquire with Harvey do transfer uh, to their working with real patients. And that's for the teaching and learning side of things. On the assessment side of the equation, Harvey has also been demonstrated to provide very reliable assessments or evaluations of these clinical skills. We're going to put Harvey aside for a second just because a problem that is frequently encountered is this, what I call the cart before the horse, cart in front of the horse phenomenon. I don't know if this uh, saying translates in other languages as much, but we have an expression that's like putting the car in front of the horse. Setting this in the context of simulation education, a very common scenario is that you come to a program and they already have a bunch of mannequins or other simulation devices. And sometimes you're left with the puzzle of, well, how am I going to try to use this? Or many times you come in and there's a well-established institution already has a curriculum in place and you kind of inherit that. What I'd like to do is take a step back Imagine that you were lucky enough to be in a brand new program. You're starting uh, from scratch. And I'd like to take you through the process of how you would go about choosing certain educational tools, certain assessment tools to meet learning goals for your curriculum. And of course, we want this to be grounded in uh, best educational practice. Many of you may be aware of the BEMI collaboration, um, best evidence medical education collaboration. Um, which has set about trying to uncover the evidence that will inform our educational practice. So the steering committee for the BME uh, collaboration years ago asked the Gordon Center to lead a systematic review looking at the uses of simulation. So given that you have a Harvey or other simulation or educational technology, the question that we try to answer based on our search of the literature is what are the features or uses of simulation that are going to lead to effective learning? Uh, we published our findings in Medical Teacher in the form of this BME guide more than a decade ago. Um, I'm proud to say that this is the most cited reference about simulation-based health professions education. In fact, it's one of the most cited medical education articles. What we uncovered uh, from this systematic review were a list of the 10 
uh, most commonly cited features uh, that contributed to positive learning outcomes. And this list is probably well familiar to most of you. Uh, things at the top of the list are like the importance of providing feedback or repetitive practice opportunities so that learners can acquire certain skills. But if you look at number three on the list, the feature was that the simulation had to be integrated into the curriculum plan. This notion of curricular integration has a couple of different aspects. One is that use of simulation should be required, integral part of the curriculum, not an optional or just for fun type of activity. We all know that our curricula get more and more full. Learners have a difficult time prioritizing, you know, where should they be spending their time? What should they be focusing their study efforts on and so forth? By setting something as a required activity, we are sending a message that we think that this is important for them to learn. I'll give you an example right from our experience with Harvey over the years. The British Heart Foundation thought so much about Harvey's utility for teaching that it made a donation of a Harvey simulator for every school in the United Kingdom. This is uh, going back uh, more than a decade and a half at this point, almost uh, 20 years ago. At that time, 27 schools in the UK received a Harvey. The British Heart Foundation then went back some time later just to see how was this uh, investment uh, being utilized. Well, some medical schools uh, put their Harvey in a prominent uh, showcase type of a place, maybe behind a glass mirror, a glass wall rather, uh, with a nice plaque that said courtesy of the British Heart Foundation, and their Harvey still sat years later. Um, whereas other schools that integrated it, made it a required part of some aspect of the curriculum, uh, for example, every student in the physical diagnosis course spent X number of hours working with Harvey. Oh, and by the way, they tested the student's skills in those curricula. Those were the places where they were showing a clear learning had occurred, both in terms of student skills, uh, knowledge, and confidence in performing the bedside cardiac exam. This notion of assessment drives learning is, is well understood by those of us in medical education. Um, again, it helps to set priorities to our learners about what we think is important. So you have to test outcomes, and we're going to come to that at the end of this uh, curriculum blueprint process. Of course, having an educational champion, someone who is uh, the Harvey guru at your institution, is going to go a long way uh, toward this notion of curricular integration. Ultimately, using educational technologies, specifically simulation, we hope will become integrated into the culture of our educational system, much like it is in aviation. Pilots, air crew can't think about um, working in that environment without having gone through simulation-based training and assessment. Another facet of this idea of curricular integration is a very important principle of curriculum alignment. So this is matching our teaching tools, our assessment tools, with uh, the most important thing, learning outcomes. After all, we are now working in the outcomes-based or competency-based educational paradigm, where that is what guides everything. Um, there used to be a lot of talk in health professions education about the process. Um, are we going to continue using lectures versus using more PBL, small group type of learning? Even simulation is that using that as a method is part of the educational process. And somewhere along the line, we had lost a focus on what about the outcomes at the end of the day, at the end of a program, when we graduate medical students or nursing students, and they're going to become practicing clinicians. What skill set, what competencies uh, have they acquired? So this is the first crucial step, defining your learning outcomes. And in fact, uh, that was another BME principle that we identified in our review, that simulation use is enhanced, or the educational outcomes are more likely achieved if the outcomes are defined up front. I've seen some places where they like to, on the first day of, use, of students uh, coming to the simulation center, they just open the door and say, go. And you throw them into that environment, well, they may come away with uh, some of the things you wanted them to learn, but the process is going to be a little bit more opportunistic. 
Whereas if you give them some notion of what outcomes you're trying to achieve up front, this session today is about uh, being able to perform CPR. This session today is about learning how to do the bedside cardiac exam. If you define those outcomes up front, they're more likely to achieve those outcomes later on. All right, so if you remember, I went at the very beginning, one of the things I asked you is, what are you trying to teach? This is trying to get at what are the outcomes that you're trying to achieve? That's why uh, this is a very important first question. So you should always ask yourself that when you're doing a, a lesson plan, a curriculum plan, what am I trying to teach? And this is about setting the objectives, okay? For Dr. Gordon, he was a cardiologist. He was trying to teach how to uh, examine patients and recognize cardiac findings and make a diagnosis that would enable best management. So he recognized that those outcomes are a fundamental thing. Doesn't matter if you're a medical student, a nursing student, whatever health professions, being able to do a physical examination, especially of the heart and lungs, uh, is a fundamental competency. They realize too that it's not just doctors um, who are needing to have these skills, it's nurses, physician assistants, and so forth. And at the time, studies showed that the traditional apprenticeship model of C1, do one just wasn't working. When residents were tested, fundamental uh, cardiac findings, they could not recognize uh, very many of them. So that was his motivation for looking for an educational tool to help improve of those outcomes. At the time, there was nothing that existed, so he went about and invented uh, the mannequin that could do that. And that's exactly what Harvey was designed to uh, fulfill that learning objective, to teach and assess bedside examination and diagnosis skills. So when you're trying to define outcomes, we recommend that you try to do this in SMART terms, and that's an acronym that you can see stands for your objectives or your outcomes should be specific especially specific to a learner level and appropriate for them. That's the A. Very important part of this uh, mnemonic is the M, measurable. At the end, we're going to have to assess whether we achieve the outcomes. So thinking about uh, them in terms that are behaviors or things that can be directly observed or measured uh, will be very helpful. We want these to be realistic. Um, and capable of being learned in the amount of time available in your curriculum. So think about the level of your learners. That was why the next question I asked was, you know, who are you teaching? Make sure that the outcomes that you set or the objectives that you set are appropriate for their developmental level. Of course, we set outcomes at many levels in a curriculum. The macro level might be the educational institutional objectives. So. Anyone who graduates from the University of Miami Medical School, we have a list of 10 uh, core outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Down at more of a mid-level, um, a given course or a clinical clerkship probably has a syllabus that defines at the beginning, these are the objectives of this unit of study. And right down to the micro level, for a given lecture or a given simulation session, these are the objectives that we're trying to accomplish. So remember, I asked, who are you trying to teach? These are very important questions. What am I trying to teach? Whom am I trying to teach? And those will help you to define your outcomes um, in smart terms. So let's uh, look at this even at a more micro level, just with Harvey outcomes. So let's say you decide that Harvey has a role in your curriculum. We have set in ours different expectations for different levels of medical students and even residents. For example, first year medical students, our expectation is that they could just identify a finding. For example, hearing and say, ah, that's a fourth heart sound, an S4. Um, in second year, once they've learned pathology and pathophysiology, we'd expect them to be able to correlate that finding with what's going on in the heart that results in that finding. In this case, it would be atrial contraction into a relatively stiff or non-compliant ventricle. As in uh, cases of hypertrophy resulting from increased afterload. Third year medical students are now doing their clinical rotations. And so when they're on internal medicine, we'd expect for them to be able to develop a differential diagnosis based on conditions that they commonly see, things that cause increased afterload, like systemic hypertension, aortic stenosis, and the like. 
higher levels for sub-interns in the final year of medical school or even interns, that's postgraduate year one residents, they should be able to take all of this information and determine chronicity, severity, and ultimately to make management decisions. Hey, I'm hearing this fourth heart sound. They probably already have hypertrophy. That's an end organ effect. I better start antihypertensive treatment now. So first and foremost, set what your learning objectives, what outcomes you're trying to achieve. Then, and only then, uh, should we actually go in search of the tools that can help to meet those educational objectives, both for the learning piece, and then we're going to talk in the next step about the assessment piece. Okay? It's very much like the process of building a house. You make a set of blueprints. This is your map going forward, how you're going to achieve your goals or your outcomes of building this structure. Okay? And just like an architect does, he describes the scope of work and he lays out how he's going to build each room, uh, each subcomponent of that larger structure. And it's much the same with uh, building a curriculum. In fact, we use a template much like this uh, as a blueprint for our curricular design. I know the print is kind of small there. I'm happy to share this actually. At the end, I'll give you my email address. And if you'd like a copy of this uh, template, we're happy to share it with you. You see that we first say what course we're in and then what specific module or session we're talking about. So this might be in the physical diagnosis course, and now we're in the cardiovascular system, and we're coming to the sim lab with our students, and we're going to set certain session objectives, which may be to have some knowledge about the cardiac examination, some psychomotor skills, such as actually being able to perform those, and perhaps there's some behavioral affective attitudes, like they need to behave professionally uh, when examining real patients, observing modesty, and so forth. Then there are a number of learning opportunities. And I like this template because it gives several different examples of things so that people don't forget that it's not always simulation. Now, that's one little danger that those of us who are simulation enthusiasts or simulation educators, sometimes um, we think that simulation is the best tool for everything. And that's not always the case. Or there might be more efficient tools. For example, if we're having mostly cognitive outcomes, knowing about the cardiac examination, well, in one simulation session, um, in a certain amount of time, you might only be able to cover a fairly narrow bandwidth of, of knowledge in that domain, whereas we could have them read um, a whole textbook chapter about it and maybe cover more of those domains. What I think simulation is best used for, the best match, the best alignment is when we are talking about psychomotor skills or those behavioral competencies uh, that require us uh, or our learners to demonstrate, to show how they can perform certain skills or act in a certain way. So we give a lot of different tools with Harvey, for example. Um, if it's cognitive things, we might refer them to the learner manual and say, read about uh, the systematic five-step approach to uh, the cardiac bedside examination. You see that we give learner manuals uh, for nursing focused uh, education as well. We also provide guides for you as the instructors. And one nice feature of these guides is that we actually give you an idea of how we have integrated Harvey across our four year curriculum here in Miami. Uh, many of you know that in North America, it's a graduate entry four year program in medicine. And so here we have matched a certain learning goals with certain conditions that Harvey can simulate at different stages in the curriculum. We give different suggestions for how this also might be used to accommodate different learning styles. For example, some people do well in a large group lecture type setting led by the instructor. Harvey can be used in that way. Other students prefer small group or even independent learning, and we set aside time so that students can practice these skills in those smaller group or independent uh, self-directed learning uh, type of approaches. And we even give you an idea of how much time we allocate for these uh, different things. So we start with normal in year one. That's a reasonable, appropriate expectation for, for novice learners in these skills. Once they learn a bit about physiology and pathophysiology, we introduce 
uh, the big left-sided valvular lesions. And then once they're on their medicine clerkship, things that are commonly seen, conditions related to coronary artery disease, hypertension, congestive heart failure, and so forth. And then in fourth year, that's the only time where this is not absolutely required. We have an elective of four weeks uh, in cardiology uh, where the students really can cover all of the conditions that Harvey can, can simulate. If you're involved in nursing education, our nursing uh, educators uh, who are part of our consortium uh, here in Miami have given us an idea of how in even just a two-year uh, nursing program, you might focus their study. Big emphasis on just recognizing what's normal and how to do a good, thorough uh, cardiovascular examination. Then they have what they consider somewhat more advanced skills for later nurses, uh, that would be identification of some common murmurs and with the approach that even if you don't know exactly what this murmur is, you're very comfortable with what's normal and you can identify an abnormality and bring that to uh, the appropriate attention of other providers. So I'm going to go back to my building a house metaphor, if you will, and have this idea about choosing the right educational tools that match our outcomes. So let's say learning objective for this session is to get that screw into a piece of wood. Okay? There's a whole range of different uh, tools that one could use for that. You could probably take that hammer and pound that screw into the wood. Uh, might do some damage along the way, be a lot more effortful. I could also try to grab the end of that screw with either the pliers or maybe even the wrench and twist it around and that might get it into the wood. Again, a lot more effortful, probably not as efficient as if I use that screwdriver, which was purpose made for the purpose of getting a screw into a piece of wood. Okay. Now let's say that that screwdriver is the simulation tool. So that's simulation methods. Okay. Again, just a caution to those of us who are uh, like our simulation modalities, that it's not always the best answer for a given educational problem. What if the learning outcomes of the next session are to drive that nail into a piece of wood? Okay, well, I could probably grab the pointy end of the screwdriver and hit that nail with the handle end, and maybe I'll get that into the wood. Again, but it won't work as well as using a different tool like the purpose-made hammer, uh, which would be just perfect, very efficient for accomplishing our learning objectives. Okay. Let's say that that hammer is another simulation modality too. One of the things, again, is that we always want to have the latest and greatest. So you can have a hammer that can get nails in or you can get this powered nail gun. And we tend to want to have the thing with all the bells and whistles and the, the latest gadgetry. If you're going to choose simulation, if it seems like that's the best match for accomplishing your curricular goals, fine. But you need to know what your simulation can do and also what it can't do. You know, that nail gun can get a lot more nails in in a shorter period of time. So in terms of efficiency, it's great. But what if the power goes out or there's no compressed air to drive that gun? Many of you are probably aware of some simulators that actually require medical gases and compressed air uh, for certain of their functions to work. What if that is not available? Then are you stuck? Perhaps a good old-fashioned hammer, a more simple type of simulation, say a task trainer, as opposed to a computerized mannequin, might actually be perfectly well-suited to accomplishing your curricular goals. So. Now, I'm finally coming back uh, to Harvey. Those of you who have been waiting patiently to see, now we're going to talk about, let's say that just like Dr. Gordon's objectives were to teach the bedside exam, we've decided that this form of simulation is going to be a tool to help us meet. We need to know about its capabilities and its limitations. Harvey didn't look like it does now back in the beginning in 1968 when it first debuted at the American Heart Association scientific meeting. Back then, uh, there were three prototypes. Each one could simulate a single cardiac condition. A little bit later, uh, they had the multiple disease state mannequin. It was still a massive piece of equipment, uh, weighed more than 500 pounds, you know, more than 250 kilos, um, and could simulate several conditions at once, but it was all mechanical movements and so forth. 
Many of you have a Harvey now that looks somewhat different. Um, it's now lighter, only about uh, 45 kilos, 90 pounds or so, more portable, less costly. Uh, the previous generation, just before our, our newest enhancements, could simulate 30 conditions in the single mannequin. We've added additional cardiac areas of auscultation and something for the first time were lung sounds as well. In addition, a microphone uh, was placed in the head of Harvey so that uh, someone could speak and be the voice of Harvey and use him for uh, standardized patient type of encounters. Of course, now Harvey looks like this, um, and we'll go to our, our live uh, version of Harvey here in just a second. You'll recognize him uh, by the new sleek gray cabinet and uh, his, his new little clothing. But what's more important are some uh, added features uh, that come in Harvey. Not so much the appearance, um, but what's inside. Um, there are some technical enhancements like how you open Harvey to access uh, the internal workings and things like that. But I'm going to focus on the educational elements that we've added. This is uh, Dr. Joe Esterson, uh, one of our master teachers here at the Gordon Center, director of cardiology training programs, using the next generation Harvey uh, to teach a group of medical students. So what are some of these new features of the next generation Harvey? We have added 10 additional cases. So now we have a total of 50 different patient scenarios. Some of them are at faster heart rates. That's been a, a feature that many of you have been asking about for a long time, especially those of you who uh, do pediatrics training. Originally, all of Harvey conditions were at 60 beats per minute. That was chosen for pedagogical reasons. It's much easier for novices to master the pattern recognition when the heart rate is nice and slow and regular. Um, but for challenging, more advanced trainees, we've now added cases at faster heart rates, and they have correspondingly increased respiratory rates uh, in some of those conditions as well. In addition, we've added some peripheral pulses for palpation. Not the mechanical version of Harvey, uh, but the latest digital version of Harvey had only a right brachial pulse that was placed on the right side because traditionally we examine patients from the right side of the bed, um, and that's where we place the blood pressure cuff. And so with that brachial artery pulse, um, you could measure and evaluate the blood pressure and so forth. We have now added brachial pulses on both arms as well as radial pulses. As many times uh, learners would come, the first thing they do when they would get to Harvey is they feel for that radial pulse before the little mechanical actuators which generated the pulses were too big to fit in the wrist. Now technological advances have been out, allowed us to uh, place the radial pulses back again. Another nice feature that comes with Next Generation Harvey is that we have packaged 10 of his conditions, 10 commonly encountered clinical uh, conditions in the form of standardized patient cases. So we've included the script that someone could either read from a remote location, speaking through the mannequin's microphone, or we've done some hybrid simulations where we actually have a live patient, a standardized patient, sitting next to Harvey, and that person delivers the history. Of course, that enables assessment of interpersonal skills as well. But then we have programmed into Harvey findings that correspond to the given history. So when they say to this SP, now I'm gonna examine you, sir, well, then they're directed to the mannequin and they can go through the systematic approach and identify findings that would go along with that history. In these packages, we have included checklists for the history taking portion, as well as the physical examination portion. We've given an assessment form that the SP can fill out if you're trying to assess interpersonal skills. So this is really a nice uh, package to be added to your curriculum, either for developing training sessions or actually for assessments. This would give you ready-made 10 OSCE stations uh, on this uh, competency domain. In addition, we are including a laptop will come with a mannequin that has the full Harvey curriculum preloaded on it, um, as well as any e-learning programs that an institution might acquire along with Harvey. I'll talk about those um, in a little while. So now I'm going to uh, step uh, to the side here, and these are some of Harvey's findings uh, that I mentioned. I'm going to actually demonstrate these live to you now, and we're going to be able to see a next generation Harvey in action. So here's my friend uh, that I've been working with uh, for a long time. We uh, emphasize in our teaching of these bedside cardiology skills, a systematic approach. We talk about five fingers 
Um, first, you observe the general appearance. Harvey doesn't appear to be in any uh, distress at this time. Um, and then we go to evaluation of the arterial pulses. Um, we'll start with the carotids. Of course, the real skill is in your fingertips. We always tell students that. But to demonstrate to you out there in the ether, um, I'll use a very simple teaching tool, which is to place a cotton swab on the pulse. And then you can see very nicely, this is a normal carotid pulse, a single impulse, normal upstroke, pulse velocity and amplitude. If I change Harvey to a different condition, I think you'll readily see that these change. Now it's quite obviously different. It's a twice beating pulse, or what we call a bifid pulse. In Latin, pulsus bisferians. You don't find that in very many conditions, actually. So if this was detected on physical exam, it would be a great clue uh, to what the diagnosis is. Many mannequins have arterial pulses like Harvey does. So you may be saying, well, so why can't I use uh, another mannequin for these skills? Well, usually the emphasis in many of the other mannequins is on whether there's a pulse or not. Many of the other mannequins are designed for acute care type of skills. Um, do I have to defibrillate this patient or not? There's not so much concern about uh, the subtle findings of the pulse. Whereas in Harvey, that makes a big difference in coming to a diagnosis. Is that pulse amplitude normal or is it slow rising, et cetera? Of course, Harvey has other peripheral pulses as well. Um, as I mentioned, he not only has bilateral carotid pulses, but he also has uh, brachial pulses. Here is the blood pressure cuff I mentioned on the right-hand side. It's a little bit out of view of the camera, but there is a palpable pulse here, as well as a radial pulse. And then there are brachial and radial pulses on the left arm as well. So that's a new feature. So more students who might be gathered around the bedside of Harvey would be able to have their hands on a pulse and use that for timing when we get to some of the auscultatory findings. This is a real blood pressure cuff. So students can measure and should measure the blood pressure on when they're examining Harvey for each condition that's going to be an appropriate blood pressure. So for example, if it's the hypertension program, then there'll be an elevated blood pressure. If it's uh, aortic regurgitation, for another example, you might have a very wide pulse pressure and so forth. After the arterial pulses, uh, the next in our, our systematic approach is to examine the venous impulses. So I'll go back to the neck, and if you observe, right here, the base of the neck, you can see the little undulation of the jugular venous waveforms. If you look very closely, you can just see that there's a double waveform, the A and the V waves. Now, I can give Harvey a different condition, um, where those will be much more obvious. Now you can see them. He has jugular venous distension. And I think you can see the two waveforms there. If I place the carotid swab on the carotid, if you kind of look at both at the same time, you can notice that the bigger wave is off sync. It precedes the carotid impulse. So that's happening in diastole when the atrium contracts. That's a giant A wave. You can give him different condition. Also with fairly obvious venous pulsations now, but if you time those two waveforms, you see that the larger one coincides with the carotid impulse. So that's a systolic wave, a giant V or CV wave as it's called. Again, why do we have these findings in Harvey? Well, from making a diagnosis at the bedside, the presence of jugular venous distension is a very important finding. Other mannequins don't have a jugular venous pulsations, none other that I know of really, um, because it's not important in the middle of a resuscitation, let's say, about whether the neck veins are distended. If they're pulseless, they're not going to have any venous waveforms, uh, and so that wasn't important for that to be included in the design of those mannequins. Along uh, sim similar lines, Harvey also has precordial impulses. So if I come out here to the chest and I place my hand on the precordium, I can feel that he has an apex beat. 
can actually feel the contour of ribs in Harvey and counting down. This is in the fifth interspace. It's the normal location, midclavicular line. I feel its size to be just about one fingertip. And I can show you what that feels like, again, by using my little cotton swab. Boom, boom, boom. You see a nice, brief, normal apical beat. You can give Harvey a different condition, say one that results in hypertrophy of the ventricle. And although the location hasn't changed, you'll notice that it's a more sustained, a more slow rising type of a pulse that we might call a heave. I give him a condition where there's chronic volume overload such that the ventricle dilates. Oh, now my apex beat seems to have disappeared. But actually, if I reach around uh, to the side, I can feel that in fact, it's been displaced inferior and laterally. It's also enlarged. It's about three finger breaths across. And you can see what this one looks like. In this particular case, it's still a brisk pulse. Seems that our ventricle hasn't yet uh, decompensated or fallen off the starling curve. If I give a patient a condition that has elevated pulmonary pressures, uh, the chambers on the right side of the heart may enlarge. In this case, I'm here now along the left parasternal edge, and I feel a double impulse there. You can notice that one probably represents a right ventricular heave or lift. If you notice in the background, you can also see that the jugulars are distended in this condition. There's also a double waveform. There's an extra impulse there. I give the carotid waveform for comparison. You can see that there's a little impulse just after the main systolic impulse. That timing uh, in early diastole uh, would probably correspond to what we call a palpable third sound, palpable S3, in this particular case, right-sided in origin. The same patient also has another movement I can feel further north along the sternum. Um, some places in the world call that a palpable P2. We call it a pulmonary artery tap or pulsation movement. I can distinguish that from the RV, right ventricular movement, because you see this one is single. It doesn't have that little extra early diastolic impulse. So these are just giving you some of the range of uh, the precordial movements. And we haven't even gone uh, to the point of listening to Harvey yet. Of course, he has almost all of the various heart sounds, murmurs, and things like that, uh, that uh, you could imagine. And I'll give you just some examples of that. I'm gonna go to, back to the normal condition just to start. I'm gonna adjust my volume and add so that you can hear heart sounds. You'll see now I'm gonna place this Harvey stethoscope at the right upper sternal edge. And hopefully, you all are hearing heart sounds. Love dub, love dub, love dub, love dub. I'm putting my hand on a pulse to feel the pulse. I can imitate the sounds based on that timing. Love dub, love dub, love dub, love dub, love dub. You'll notice that the second heart sound is louder, as you would expect here at the base of the heart. Similarly, uh, it's still louder than the first heart sound, which we can time along with our carotid here at the upper left sternal border. If you listen very carefully, not only does he have uh, these heart sounds uh, present throughout all the classic auscultatory areas, but Harvey's heart sounds are also timed with respiration. So actually, let me I'll come in a little bit closer. 
I put a little marker here on the abdomen. If you can notice, see how that's moving up and down. So if you pay attention here, you can hear with inspiration, splitting of the second sound. That may be a little subtle, so I'll move down to the tricuspid area and give you a different finding. Um, here you'll obviously hear a murmur. You can see that it occurs at the time of the carotid impulse, so it's a systolic murmur. And if you watch the breathing again, in, it gets louder, out, it gets softer, in, louder. So inspiratory augmentation, this is tricuspid regurgitation. That inspiratory change, a sign that this is right-sided in origin. We could go back to the apex and listen with the bell of the diaphragm. And here, Hopefully you're all able to hear that low frequency extra heart sound, the third heart sound. Of course, murmurs would radiate as you would expect. Here's a systolic murmur at the loudest here at the right upper sternal edge. As you might expect, uh, this is aortic stenosis. And as is typical, especially with more severe disease, you can hear that murmur radiating to the carotids. Harvey also has lung sounds um, in six areas. Anteriorly, we have upper and lower lung fields. And to listen to the basses in Harvey, since he can't sit up for a posterior exam, um, one could listen here infralaterally. Uh, for the basis of the lungs. So this is just a quick run through of some of the potential findings. You can see there's a lot of potential here. If these capabilities of Harvey uh, match your learning objectives, then um, that would be a good reason for you to use Harvey or integrate it into your curriculum. Um, on the other hand, if you are trying to teach other skills like how to do CPR or how to intubate, well, Harvey was not designed for that. In fact, we have a little uh, warning in the learner manual, do not give chest compressions, no precordial thump. You see, you can't intubate Harvey because it's not uh, designed for that purpose. There are other mannequins which are very well suited uh, for reaching those types of uh, learning outcomes. Besides, the findings there, uh, this, this wealth of uh, possible uses of Harvey, uh, what else sets Harvey apart? Well, of course, it's one of the only university-based simulation projects in medical education. Uh, we've done numerous, often multi-center studies that demonstrate Harvey's effectiveness, including, as mentioned earlier, that these skills transfer uh, to real patients. Harvey is currently used at more than 600 institutions around the world. I mentioned earlier uh, that Harvey comes bundled with a laptop that has a curriculum with it. All 50 cases that Harvey can simulate have a complete uh, PowerPoint slide set uh, to help guide learners uh, toward mastering these competencies. So these are case-based, so it starts with the history, and then you'll notice at the bottom of the slide there's a question. Um, so these can be used for independent, self-directed learning by the students. We place a computer with the curriculum on it right next to Harvey so that they can go back and forth examining the simulator and then answering these guided questions. Let's see. Um, Harvey, of course, the slides goes into a lot of detail about the physical findings, how you would interpret the venous pulses. They'd go and look at Harvey's neck veins and come back and answer that question. Um, they would feel the precordium. Here we give a little graphic, but they would go and put hands on Harvey to feel that apex beat and then answer the question, how do you interpret the impulse? Of course, the escultatory findings are presented here graphically, but they would listen to Harvey. And we always uh, set our lessons um, with the underlying physiology and pathophysiology 
uh, that underpins them. The UMedic programs uh, came about in the early 80s as some of the first e-learning programs in medical education. Um, these take the same curriculum, but flesh it out in multimedia form. Uh, the newest versions of UMedic are now web-based so that students can access this information any place, any time. So this is really for uh, facilitating just-in-time learning. And because they are multimedia, uh, with computer speakers or even with handheld devices, uh, they could hear the sounds uh, and review these important lessons, even when they aren't able to be uh, with the mannequin. Okay. Now we're coming to the end. We need to close the loop. It's not enough to list these are the outcomes we're going to try to achieve uh, and then set about our educational plan and get our tools uh, to teach to those objectives. Um, they're just words on paper, a list, uh, unless we assess whether the outcomes have been achieved. There's a second page to our curriculum blueprint because there's many different opportunities for doing that assessment. Again, if we were trying to assess knowledge, we could probably use written instruments like multiple choice question exams or even short answer constructive response questions. Um, or I could ask students in an oral examination about these things. I think where simulation is the best aligned tool for assessment is again in those domains that are psychomotor skills or affective or behavioral competencies, where they actually have to demonstrate that they can go through the steps actually recognize the sounds and come to a diagnosis. Um, our current center director, Dr. Barry Eisenberg, who's well known uh, in medical education and in simulation as well, um, posited this formula uh, to try to achieve the effective use of, of simulation in health professions education. A lot of times we talk about the training sort of resources that are necessary. So what kind of mannequins, what kind of computer programs, the various technologies. Um, less often talked about, but no less important, um, is the importance of um, having trained educators. This webinar, I hope, is a one step toward your uh, faculty development for how to use this particular educational resource. Um, there are many other opportunities for you to improve uh, your skills as a simulation instructor. We offer courses, um, a series called ISIM, Improving Simulation Instructional Methods, uh, that one could attend if you're looking to improve uh, your simulation teaching skills and practice. Um, we also offer simulation research fellowships. We've had international physicians and nurse educators who have spent uh, six months to up to two years with us uh, to hone their educational skills. They've gone on to become founders of the Simulation Society in their home country uh, and leaders uh, in education. Of course, the last factor that's critically important in this, which sums up our whole discussion today, is that of curricular integration. It has to be institutionalized. It's not enough to have a great sim center with great resources or even to have trained faculty. You don't have support on the institutional level. Um, people that will protect faculty time um, will allocate the necessary resources, then you're not going to achieve the outcomes that you're trying to reach. You'll notice that we made this formula as a product, not a sum of these factors, because if any of them is zero, uh, then unfortunately, the outcome will be nil. So we've come to the end of our time together. I hope that... Uh, We've accomplished our objectives. I hope you can describe the features of the Next Generation Harvey and the UMedic e-learning programs. Um, we've talked a lot about the importance of integrating any educational technologies in the curriculum if you want to achieve your outcomes. And I hope I've given you some tips here for how you could integrate these tools into your particular educational program, since many of you are involved with clinical skills education. If there aren't any further questions, my email address is there. Of course, our website is there, too, where you can get a lot more information about our University of Miami educational systems. Feel free to email me with questions, or if you'd like a copy of that a curriculum blueprint, I'd be happy to send that to you. I really appreciate the time that you spent with me today. Um, and looking forward to uh, the next time to uh, chat again together. Thank you so much. <laughs>